we continue our travels in the Israeli Negev Desert. And today, we're visiting the Timna Park. It is one of the largest attractions in the south. What a beautiful valley. Have you ever seen anything like this before? It is full of amazing history from the time of King Solomon to the Egyptian pharaohs. Today, we will see incredible formations. This is really cool. Yeah. It's so unique. Visit the ancient copper mines. It's our mining shaft, you see it's covered with sand. Climb Solomon's pillars. What did it say? And as the best part, we're going to visit a life-size replica of the tabernacle. A tent that God instructed Moses to build in order to have a transportable sanctuary during the exodus from Egypt to the promised land of Israel. All this and much more in today's episode of Sergi and Rhoda in Israel. Are you excited? Yes. Timna Park is located just about 20 miles north of the city of Eilat and it is easily accessible from the main road. Oh, look, look at the colors of these mountains and how massive they are. The Timna Park is very large, so it's recommended to have a car to explore it. Our first stop is to check out a very uncommon stone formation called the Mushroom. The mushroom is an unusual formation. It is made of the red sandstone, a very soft rock. And so over centuries, the wind, humidity, and water erosion formed this mushroom-shaped formation. Wow, this is really cool. Yeah. It's so unique. What a beautiful valley. Have you ever seen anything like this before? No. It's beautiful. We had no idea what this park is gonna look like. But now that we're here, the first impression is, wow. In the vicinity of this formation, archeologists found ancient copper ore mining sites. This site serves as one of the most important important archaeological windows into the history of copper mining and production. So these are vertical mining shafts. Right now it's uh, covered with sand, but it goes deeper in there. There are chisel marks that would use chisels, copper chisels, to get copper out of here. This is one of the oldest copper mines in the world. And when copper gets in contact with air, it starts oxidizing and it goes green. So it's so easy to spot copper here. Look, you see this rock here? It's all green in the sides. And if you walk, you see green patches. And that's where you know you can start mining for copper. That's why we see those vertical shafts of copper mines. So cool. These are the ancient copper mines. Let's go take a look. Babe, yeah. these are ladders. No way. Look. Wow. This looks like there would be steps and you can just crawl up. Oh, you cannot crawl up. I'm ladders. sorry, babe. You cannot. I definitely can. You can, but you won't. So this park has been through much controversy over its name and its dating. When Nelson Gluck first excavated this place in 1930s, he claimed that the date of the site goes back to the King Solomon and that brought a lot of attention to this location. Ironically, 30 years after Nelson's discoveries, additional excavation projects took place and they dated the site to 300 years before King Solomon was even born. They said this place does not belong to King Solomon. It goes way back, way earlier. But just recently, in 2008, renewed archaeological excavations found something really cool. They performed high-precision radiocarbon dating on organic samples at the site, and it showed that the site does date back to the time of King Solomon. So 
So we go from the 30s, hey, this is the King Solomon site, to the 60s, no, it's not, to today, yes, King Solomon was here. In these copper mines, a significant amount of ancient artwork can be seen in plain sight. So up there on that mountain are the drawings from 12th to 14th century BC. They're fighting. Animals. Oh, this is uh, bow and spear, or bow and arrow, sorry. Bow. So what I'm touching here are actually replicas but the real ones are here on the walls in its original form, from its original time. It's really unbelievable. These are the hunting ibexes. They depict hunting ibexes and ostriches with lasso and boomerang. The hunters are native of the Negev Mountains and they worked here in Timna in the copper mines back at that time. Incredible. It blows my mind to think that the work of someone's hands left a 3,000 year old trace. And it just reminds me that what I do today and what I say today can leave an eternal impact for the good or for the bad. Next, we're driving to the most impressive formation in this park. It's called the Solomon Pillars. So these are natural sandstone structures and they were formed throughout centuries by water corrosion. Wow, they're so massive. Look at them. They're incredible. Wow. These pillars were named Salmon Pillars by Nelson Gluick, who performed the initial excavations in the 1930s in this area. I can't hold it much longer. So it's a pretty recent name. You just saved the whole pillar from falling. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Climbing lesson number two. Don't go running up the cliff. It will exhaust you. So while Sergio is running around in the mountains, I've decided to check out this ancient uh, Egyptian temple at the bottom of the cliff. According to excavations, this used to be a shrine of Hathor, an Egyptian goddess of mining, and then in later period, it became a shrine for the Midianites. The archaeologists found here a large number of beautifully decorated pottery and metal jewelry. These were most likely gifts brought by the Midianites for the shrine. However, one of the most significant finds was a copper snake with gilded head. It is strikingly similar to the copper serpent described in the Book of Numbers. The evidence for Midianite culture found here in this site is of extraordinary importance. You see, in Exodus 18, the Bible says that Moses went with Jethro, a high priest of Midian. That means that there had been a Midian presence here, and this site not only proves that, but also paints a better picture of the Median culture and their activity in this region. There you are. <coughs> what was up there? <laughs> so... <coughs> it's like you run up and there's so much excitement. And it's so much fun and you're running and you're full of energy like this is easy. And then you get to the top and then your lungs get cut up and they get like, oh, what did you think? What were you thinking running up there? You're not trained for this. Oh. <laughs> for our last and final stop today, we are heading to a very unique attraction. When I read the book of Exodus, I always imagined that because of millions of Israelites going through the desert, that the tabernacle would have been very, very large. It would have been giant. So the priests would be able to perform their Levitical duties. 
This tent is actually built according to the exact size given by God himself to Moses, as it is written in the book of Exodus. The size in the Bible is given in ancient biblical cubit measurement, and most scholars agree that it should be around 75 feet wide and 150 feet long. And now that we're here and I'm seeing the life-size tabernacle, I can't believe my eyes, the tabernacle is not as giant as I always pictured it, it's actually more of a size of an Olympic pool. I thought it would be bigger because the people were a lot, but um, one of the workers reminded me of how much they have to carry, so that makes sense. If you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Of course, they needed to take it down, carry it in the desert, then put it back up. It just wouldn't make sense to build something the size of a Herod's second temple and then keep on taking it down and putting it back up while in the desert. I've just never given it proper thought and I'm so glad that I can see it now so the next time I read the text in Exodus account I'm properly able to imagine how it looked like so the visual always gives that benefit and I'm so glad I was able to see this. It's awesome. Walking into this tent, seeing the artifacts, touching them it does help me understand of the physical specifications that God instructed the Israelites to build. But it doesn't explain why. Why is the veil there? Why was it blue, purple and scarlet? Why did God instruct to have bread on the table at all times? Why were there two cherubim on the ark? God gave so many meticulous details and they all have very important purpose and great symbolism. In Exodus chapter 40, God instructed Moses the exact order in which this tabernacle should be set up every time they take it down and move it to a new place. And the order was pretty simple. After the Ark of the Covenant and the veil was in place, they were to put the table of showbread, then the menorah, then the screen door to the tent. And here is what's striking. In the book of John, Jesus proclaimed himself in the exact same order that matches these elements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. It's an incredible match, but it doesn't stop here. There are seven I am proclamations and they all follow the exact same pattern as the tabernacle setup. And the thing is, Jesus did not say these things in one sentence. Between each I am, there was days, months. And when John wrote them down, it's also not in the same verse. It's spread out through chapters. And so this order was there, but as far as we know, nobody's ever found it before. This is very recent. This was found just a couple of years ago. So this means this pattern couldn't have been contrived. And it means that it could have not been there by chance. So if you're interested to know more about the tabernacle, its significance and the symbolism, you should watch this study by Charlie Garrett. The link is in the description of this video below. I have heard that this place has a crafts corner where you can fill out a bottle of colorful sand and take it back home with you. Okay, okay, got it. There we go. So when you come to Timna Park, you get a little bottle so you could do your own sand art and get colorful sands to layer. It's so cool. That's what we're gonna do now. What do you wanna do with them? I don't know. I don't know, I don't have like art. Ooh, now yellow. Now yellow? Yeah. I think you have to hold them in like an angle. I don't especially love crafts, um, maybe some things, but this thing with the sand, it's pretty cool. I like doing that. Okay, yeah, I'll say that's enough crafts for today. There you go, not bad. Looks like a Jamaican flag. That's awesome. It's your turn. If you enjoyed this episode and you like this type of nature, check out our other videos about this region and this area, also the Dead Sea a lot and many many more. And also subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you'll be notified when we release a new video. Also comment below and tell us what you think of this one. Alright, let's head out. Let's head out. Let's head out. 
not by walk. We should go by car. Right. 